Welcome to the Million Vegan Grandmothers podcast. And I am here today with Cameron Waters. Thank you, Cameron, for being here. It's such a great pleasure. Of course, of course. Thank you for having me. Well, Cameron was a big inspiration, a huge inspiration in bringing a very controversial, powerful, inspiring documentary forward, Christ Spiracy, with a question that he wasn't able to leave alone. And is there a spiritual way to kill an animal? And what would Jesus do? So thank you, Cameron, for, for allowing that question to just stay burning in your heart until you were able to bring some information forth and really research this. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no way that I couldn't uh, couldn't not do it, I guess, if that's a way to say it. It's definitely one of those things that kind of burns at you when you come, you know, from my background and kind of the ways that I was led into that. It's uh, it's become an obsession of mine uh, even before I met Kip. And so I'm really blessed to have been able to meet him and go on the journey to create uh, this piece, because it's 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 really it started out as just something that I was looking for for myself and trying to understand. And now it's become uh, such a beautiful, I guess, expose and really a position of a discussion that needs to be had whose time has come. And it certainly has come to that. You know, I was um, I studied with a in an Essene community, actually, with Dr. Gabriel Cousins and the Essenes. And Gabriel would tell us there's no doubt that Jesus was a vegan and James as well. And 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 so it's interesting the information that was hidden from us, like like many things, you know, that happen in a world where money and the power of the very, very small elite. I think Dr. Will Tuttle says 8,000 people in the world are basically deciding how things go down. So it's a very small percentage, but it's people like you and Kip and filmmakers and vegans and activists that are burning in their heart to be able to bring forth truth. And so thank you for being that change. So can you tell us a little bit about our listeners, a little bit about how you met Kip and then the documentary and the process, what it felt like to be in the process of, of building a documentary and then what's happening now. So it's kind of a big question that what, it, you know, in, in AA, we say what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. So thank you. <laughs> of course. Yeah. It's actually a really long story, but I'll try to sum it up uh, as quickly as possible with just some of the key highlights. I mean, first of all, I'm, probably the least likely person in some respects to even find myself on this path. I was, you know, born and raised Southern Baptist and uh, was a hunter, avid hunter, avid fisherman. I went out 40 miles offshore every single summer with my stepdad's family to go deep sea fishing. And I also even worked at a barbecue restaurant in my teenage years that my stepfather owned. So like a family owned barbecue restaurant heavy, heavy meat eater. We used to have a funny phrase that's not so funny anymore, but uh, at the time, you know, after a good day at church and going to have a barbecue or whatever, we would say good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. That's like a kind of almost sitting around the round table with all the, with all the, uh, you know, I guess men and, 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 and boys after a hunt or whatever it was, that was kind of how it all happened. So that's where I come from. So the, I always like to establish that for people that may think, oh, you know, you have some kind of bias going into this or whatever. It was quite, if there was any bias, it was a bias towards the, you know, side of eating animals. And essentially I went on a journey, um, around 17, 18 years old, starting out with this, where I did a Daniel fast, which is based on the biblical prophet Daniel, who abstains from eating animal flesh because he's a slave in this kingdom. And it's a way that he preserves his own lifestyle and way. And, uh, he is tested against everyone in the kingdom and he's the healthiest, strongest, and wisest person in the whole kingdom. And so, Protestants, you know, Baptist, where I come from, it's a Protestant tradition. A lot of Protestants utilize, in a way, this kind of Daniel fast almost as like their Lent, in a way. So my family and I decided, a, a select group of us decided to do this Daniel fast when I was 17. And over the course of the next few years, as we did it, 
I became more and more interested in it because it made me feel so good. Um, it also really did feel like it aligned me more spiritually. I would, you know, read scripture throughout that time and dig deeper. And that was really, you know, 17, 18 years old. That was when I was starting to take my faith more seriously and more personally. You know, I was growing up just kind of hearing it coming from the outside in, but it was the time when it really started to, you know, become something from the inside out where I really felt some changes and some connections that were happening. And one of the big processes that did happen during that time was, coming to ask this question about, well, wait a minute, if Daniel, you know, practiced this way and it's in the scripture and I have this whole other lifestyle and it was actually uncomfortable at times to think about removing those. It really was a fast for me. It was removing this thing that was such a common lifestyle factor for me, eating barbecue and fishing and all of this stuff. So it raised a lot of questions eventually because I'm reading the scripture and wanting to find out what this whole position was, if it was, if it was mentioned anywhere else in the Bible, uh, you know, eating vegetables or re re refraining from eating animals and obviously find Genesis 129 in the garden of Eden, God's prescribed diet of, of, you know, seed bearing plants. And so that just opened up a whole, I guess, rabbit hole that we could expand on for hours, but that's, that's what led me down the road. And then um, after a lot of research really, really coming to find so much overwhelming evidence in support of this path and in support of this lifestyle of questioning um, our treatment of animals and in an ethical sense and how it relates to, you know, specifically for me, the Christian faith and the kind of contradictions that I found from, you know, myself included and many others who love animals and support animals, especially pets and whatnot. And I'm sure, you know, advocate for wildlife and all of that yet eating animals, you know, so frequently all the time. Uh, it, I understood and started to see that cognitive dissonance and that disconnect. And what, why, why is it that our scriptures or at least the interpretation of our scriptures lead people to feel so comfortable with this or even support and, or even affirm and, and kind of, almost feel like it's commanded that we do this. So that led to a lot of questions. I started almost writing a book, so to speak, about it over time with some notes that I was making. Um, at the time, you know, once I got deeper into my faith and whatnot around 22, 23 years old, I was fully in a uh, gospel music career and moved to Los Angeles to pursue making gospel music, writing gospel music, but that was when I was at the peak of these big questions, which ultimately landed on the question, OK, I, I'm looking at all these scriptures and questioning this ethical kind of concern around animals. And but ultimately, as a Christian, it's all centered around Christ. So what would Jesus do about it? You know, and really coming to understand, you know, 99 percent of all animals are factory farmed uh, that we consume. And that's horrible, horrible conditions. And I know most other Christ followers would, you know, think that that practice is abhorrent, but they just may not know that it's 99%. So I just, it, it caused a big ethical dilemma of biblical proportions, I like to say. And so by the time I met Kip, I was already pretty deep into studying the scriptures and understanding a lot about this for myself. But when we met and we had this conversation around how would Jesus kill an animal and uh, and beyond, you know, talked about his background and where he was coming from. He was already kind of considering making an ethical film, but maybe not as much on the spiritual or religious angle. But through our conversation, we banded together and really understood, hey, if we're going to tackle the ethical conversation, you almost have to go at it with a religious uh, side to it. Because just like the previous films Kip has made, Cowspiracy, What the Health, Seaspiracy, they look at, you know, the environment and the health concerns, but the biggest concern is the environmental and health nonprofit organizations that aren't talking about it. And so similarly, if you're going to talk about ethics, the nonprofits of ethics are essentially religions, whichever, you know, a uh, society you grow up in, whether you're religious or not, if you grew up in the West, your values are shaped by, you know, some kind of Jewish Christian type, uh, you know, foundation uh, here in the West, it's primarily Christianity. But if you grew up in the East, you know, depending on where it may be Buddhism or it may be Hinduism at the foundation of your ethics, you may not practice it anymore. You may even think it's archaic and it's your parents or, you know, the society or the politics. It's all about that. But still, your your mindset is influenced by that. 
so I think it, you know, we realize it's really important to, to, to look at this. And since then to describe how it's felt, it's been a, <laughs> it's been a completely, uh, just amazing, uh, how do I say revelatory, um, demanding, challenging, all the things adventure to get to the point where we, you know, got all these amazing interviews, had these revelations, put it together in a film, eventually had our, you know, uh, backer Netflix tell us that they wanted to take the film in a different direction than we were taking it. We didn't agree, had to take the bold decision to step away from Netflix, the biggest streaming platform in the world, um, to do this independently, to tell the story as we thought it needed to be told. But now we're so excited because the possibilities are endless doing this independent. It's a lot harder and it's a lot of work. And we've just done a big, you know, theatrical screening for two days, but now we're pushing towards our digital release. Um, I don't know when this podcast is going out. Maybe the digital release is already out by now, but regardless, we're working really hard to, to get it out to the world in every, you know, uh, subtitled in every language that we can um, dubbed in some languages and all through a pay it forward method. So it's accessible to everyone, no matter what your financial means are. Oh, that's incredible. What dates do you think you'll have that available? This, the streaming. We don't have an exact date set yet, but it will be soon. It's it's all a matter, you know, the film is 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 basically there. We're making a few tweaks to it, a, a couple little just adjustments from some feedback and some th feelings that we had after screening it for the two days in theaters everywhere. Um, so that's pretty much ready. The big thing is is the testing of our platform and making sure it's solid. So no matter how many people log in. Uh, from around the world, they're going to be able to watch this film, you know, without any interruptions or hiccups. And uh, like I said, it's going to be accessible to everyone everywhere. And um, we, you know, we love that because it keeps this free from censorship. And, you know, in the world that we're in right now, putting out something like this, you just never know what kind of notes you may hit with certain groups or industry or whatever. You have to be careful just to have your own means to distribute. Um, but beyond that, we're excited because not being locked into an exclusive contract with a partner like Netflix, who, you know, we still have other films on Netflix and uh, the split was amicable. And, you know, it's great for what they've done to get these films seen up to this point. But we really feel with this one, it's such an international, global, more independent film. It's really a film for the people and by the people we feel, which is why we did the crowdfund and we have all these producers behind it now. Um, so we're excited, you know, to now have really collective ownership over all of the additional material from the film, you know, the film's 90 minutes or so, but there's so much extra information and in all the extended interviews, the, the deleted scenes. I mean, we had to delete so many scenes to cut it down, things that we really loved that we had to pull out just for time. So we're going to be able to release all of that through our platform. And again, this pay it forward model that continues to ideally make it a, a self-sustaining uh, system where we can continue to make more and more content around this theme. Oh, that's amazing. So there may be a Christ conspiracy too. <laughs> yeah, something like that. We have we have really, you know, just in the film itself, when you watch it, if you haven't seen it yet, you'll notice that even though it's called Christ conspiracy, Christianity is or, or the story of Christ. Christ is the through line, the glue of the film that kind of pulls it all together because the massive reveal in the film is centered around Christ and what happened in the temple 2000 years ago and what he was really about, what the Nazarenes were really about, who they were, um, and a bit of the story about around why we don't know some of the details and mistranslations that are happening. But we also go into the other major religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, and uh, Islam. And we touch, you know, on them in different various forms. There's so much deeper that we could go. You know, we talk about kosher and halal only just for a small portion of the film. But each one of those is a whole film in and of itself. So we do plan whether it's full films or just, you know, shorter you know, many films on these smaller specific subjects throughout it. We are really excited to, you know, journey into figuring out what kind of content we can pull together from that. But yes, even there's there's content that we didn't even touch or even come close to in the making of this film that's now been revealed since finishing. That's just a continuation of the story, specifically on the kind of Christ uh, Christianity story, these revelations around lost scriptures and 
all of this that we're following currently right now that yes, who knows could become some continuation uh, in, in future film. Yes, thank you for doing an independent film that isn't sponsored or going to be controlled by any other sources because this is powerful. The majority of people in the world, they they do relate to some type of religious belief. And you're speaking to all those people in the film and the ability to continue releasing footage and, and sharing with people that the story doesn't end here. And I'm sure you'll have much more coming forth when people start to uh, share this film. So has it been widely shared already? Well, we did 650 plus theaters in really worldwide, but the English speaking nations. So um, we had uh, America, um, UK, Ireland, New Zealand, et cetera, and Australia, and lots of people came out. But besides that, we've only had a few other small test screenings and whatnot of the film. So there's still a lot of people waiting, just dying to see it. We did all of our producers saw the film, which is a somewhere around two to 3,000 people um, got a link because they supported us early on. So they got to see one of the earliest cuts of the film as well. But yeah, we're, we're only just getting started. Um, but so far, the reception has just been amazing. Our Rotten Tomatoes score, uh, just so humbled by that. It's it's 97 percent uh, critics, you know, audience review. Um, and you, we've had over 500 people uh, do that. So if someone by the way, if someone's listening to this and you have seen it and you haven't done a Rotten Tomatoes review, please do that, because that's one of the best ways you know and ideally a five-star one but obviously we want you to be as honest as possible but we we uh that supports us so much because so many people who are looking to make the the, the decision to click watch on a film often look at rotten tomatoes to see what the score is uh, to see if they want to you know actually give their time to something so we're really really happy about that and i think also too it's just important to know on the religion side of it is that this film you know uh, as edgy as it is, by no means uh, bashes any religion at all. Um, that's not our goal with this at all. It's really to inform and un unveil and get to the root of this kind of argument. And through that process, we, I feel, just revealed how beautiful religions actually are in their, you know, pure, original intention and purpose. And I don't want to give away more than that, but just I want everyone to know, because I know there can be skepticism with a film like Christ Spiracy, you know, and and uh, oh, what you know, what is it that they're actually trying to achieve with this? And really, it's nothing more than answering that question about our treatment of animals. If we are going to consume them, uh, how do we spiritually or ethically do that when there is the act of killing involved? And so we went on a genuine journey to explore that through all of these religions. And um, it is an uncomfortable question at times. But that's what I feel we have to do to really learn and to grow and to up level, uh, you know, what we're doing as a society. And through that process, yet yeah, the religious component only becomes more beautiful, as you'll see in the film. Yeah, and people get to make the connection then, camera, Cameron, that we're just we're just all caretakers with dominion, literally meaning to care for, not to have power of abuse over and the grandmother's pledge is to love and protect the grandchildren of all species all species and that's what that's what this does it says you know if we stop eating the flesh and secretion of animals and imprisoning them the way the way that um we were all told you know thou shall not kill and we don't have to kill that's the interesting thing about it all is is the disconnect with people that we we don't have to kill we can protect we can love and it can be really inclusive so thank you for bringing that forth because what it's doing in that uncomfortable phase of change which is always uncomfortable we're saying we need to align and that's what this film's doing that you and kit brought forth is that you're asking people to align their deepest morals, their deepest philosophies, their deepest truth with who they really are. Just alignment. We're all coming back into alignment. We always were supposed to be born with our spark of divine in the garden. 
and you're just asking people to come back to the garden, you know, and, and maybe there was, as Gabriel says, you know, Rabbi Gabriel Cousins says, we were maybe given permission to eat flesh after the flood because there was nothing else to eat. But the, but the, but the truth was, if you must, if you are, if you have nothing else, and that's even up for controversy, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's realigning with our, with ourselves and becoming, coming true to ourselves. My granddaughter and I were driving around a little bit yesterday to, um, to bring her home from school and she's five and, and she wanted to go to this place to eat. And I said, no, they serve animals there. And I, uh, I said, you know, she says, well, we eat animals, Oma, you know, haven't you listened to dad that they make us strong? And I said, well, Oma knows a lot too. And, and so my partner said, well, you only lost the battle for now. And, and I think about your story in the beginning of this podcast is like at 17, 18, you developed your own sovereignty around it. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So has any of your family gone vegan since this film? Yes, yes. Um, and even before. So it started um, It started really around when I was 17 or 18. My mother and my uncle, uh, her, her oldest brother, both did the fast as well in their own right. But it was my uh, mother who at the same time around that same season, she was a insurance saleswoman and she had to go audit a chicken farm. And she saw the battery cages for the first time and came home and started throwing all the chicken out. And then that eventually evolved into throwing more and more types of meat out. And, uh, you know, my stepdad, who she was married to at the time, owned a barbecue restaurant. So it became quite the controversy within the house of mom wanting to, you know, uh, refrain from eating animals. And then around the same time as well, my uncle, her oldest brother, who was just a big, big, empathetic, big hearted animal lover, I would say out of all the family, he was probably the one um, that tapped into the ethical side of this, this lifestyle more deeply and quickly than any of us. Um, and you know, for me, even with the Daniel fast, it was kind of more of a spiritual thing in a way as, as interesting as that sounds. I was in a time in my life where I just really wanted to follow God as much as I could. And so when I was reading this in the scripture, it really came from that. It came from kind of almost like a place of like, obedience to the path that I wanted to be on, almost like a monastic type thing or something. Um, but then I started to feel amazing. And then so the health benefit argument came in. Then not too long after that, obviously, cowspiracy and some of these other things came into the mix where you're hearing about the environmental impacts. That comes into play because I love nature and creation. But still, over time through all of that, the ethical thread and really under, because we're so programmed to, and even myself, you know, to to see a dog a certain way, but to see uh, farm animals and fish, fishes a different way. Um, so it really did take me time over time to, I think, for the layers of my heart to soften in a certain way to really feel the deep, empathetic, ethical uh, side of it all. But then once that clicked, it's almost like everything else went out the window and none of it means as much as, is that, you know, core piece. And I really think that's, what's most important, but interestingly too, thinking about my family, I mean, every member of my family has a part to play in what's led me here. Um, I mean, my, my dad, who my mom and my dad, they had me when, when they were 16 and 17, they were really, really young. And so my dad, at the time, my mom came from the Southern Baptist Christian household. My dad's not so much. And my dad became kind of this bohemian uh, in my young years, um, you know, growing up. He did van life as well and got really into, you know, Rastafarianism and all these kinds of things. And so when I was growing up, he used to have a um, sticker on his van that said, what if deer shot back? Because he was at least against that violence. And he experimented with some vegetarianism with my stepmom. But then coming back to my uh, grandparents and specifically my grandmother, um, it's which is beautiful because that's this podcast. I call her my Mima. Um, you mentioned it; it made me think of it because you said vegan million, you know, vegan grandmothers, and then you said about going to the garden, and it. I just got this visual of when I was really, really young. My Mima used to take me into her garden in the backyard at her house, and she would pick fresh mint and make mint tea out of it. 
and we'd oh. sit and we'd, we'd talk in the garden for hours. And most of, you know, I was probably eight or so years old. And most of the time was me asking her questions. Why about everything we would, it was almost like these deep, as deeply philosophical as I could get at eight years old. That was my time spent with my Mima, and she was, you know, she rescued animals and loved animals. And then her husband, my grandfather, he got me really deep into scripture, taught me thou shalt not kill when I was really, really young, uh, took me to, you know, um, Bible school where I learned that humans were vegetarian in the garden of Eden. I remember that learning that as a kid. So all these seeds were planted by all these different members of my family. And then, yeah, at a certain point I became, I guess, more so the spearhead on all of it and was really talking about and, and uh, trying to understand this. And over time, I think it just deepened all of their perspective on it. And now, yeah, I'd say most of my family is fully vegan or really, really close to it. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. So beautiful. <laughs> Well, it's it's amazing. Sometimes it's the children that plant the seeds. Sometimes it's the the grandparents. But we're all planting seeds. And thank you for sharing that because you have this beautiful, humble way of seeing people for their beauty and their strength and, and just inviting them in. And I think that's such a great way for vegans to live. It's not that we don't have strong belief systems or ways that we want to move forward. I mean, I'm going to be really excited for the day that my grandchildren are vegan. Um, but right now they have a huge influence by their parents who, who know, um, but aren't quite ready to soften those layers of their hearts yet. You know, they yeah. love, their, they love their, their dogs, but they haven't got down to the layer of that. They're all beings of, of light. And I remember my beautiful partner, Paul Pappen, who's also part of our grandmother community. And just a little uh, message that anybody listening to this, if you want to join the Million Vegan Grandmothers, it doesn't, um, we we don't uh, differentiate between sex or age. It's, um, it's a vegan community of people that are remembering their wisdom, their innate wisdom. But I remember the first time Paul watched a video recently, about a year ago, uh, from Renee's farm and uh, sanctuary and Rowdy Girl Sanctuary. And she was, and when she was calling the cows from the field one morning and they came running, you know, like our dog would when we call them and she was laying down scratching and, and how happy it was to be with her, this, this, her animal, her friend. And, um, and he cried. He was very moved. It, you know, he was already vegan because he he didn't want to look at that stuff, but to look at the the beauty of the connection instead of just all the horrors is is a really powerful way to bring people in as well. And I think right yeah. now, actually, Renee is just having a screening in L.A. as we speak of Rowdy Girl Sanctuary um, documentaries. So. Thank you, Cameron, so much. It's such an inspiration that you have shown up and um, softened the layers of your heart. That really moved me when you say, said that. You know, I think about all the ways that we all come together and soften and soften and soften and join and join the community of vegans. It was an interesting, I, I had a conversation with a dear friend of mine who's an amazing vegan artist, uh, which I was thinking about you at the time. He did this beautiful uh, painting called Alternative Nativity. I will mm -hmm. share with you. Maybe we'll put the link underneath this podcast, but it, it's this, this woman in maybe some sort of manger setting, but she's holding a lamb and she's also holding a baby. And there's all these beautiful animals behind her and then all these carcasses out on a cross. It's a powerful, powerful painting. And we were talking this morning about that disconnect and how we just are here to continue aligning, aligning, aligning. And yeah, we really are and keeping our hearts soft in a world where we are super distracted and we're told to look away. So thank you. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I feel too, even specifically coming from my tradition of, of Christianity, which I 
echo what you said earlier about the number of people who are, you know, from these various backgrounds, you know, Christianity, that's 2.3 or so billion people around the world. I think once you do, once your heart does become more softened, it, it, you start to really see with new eyes and see things that you missed along the way. And the, the nativity as is, is one of those great moments where you miss a message that's there you know my whole life around christmas time i've gone to see nativities my family have had nativities placed on their mantles above the fireplace and all of that but now all i can see is this you know little baby jesus surrounded by farm animals it's always farm animals around them and they're always looking at him in anticipation of like hey, here's this human being that's maybe going to say something or step up in this compassionate way, which again, you'll see in the film Christspiracy what that really means. Uh, and you mentioned in the painting, the other anim the, the, the dead animals in the background. I mean, what was happening at that time 2000 years ago with all of the ritual animal sacrifice and how that related to this aspect of the mission of, of Christ that's been missed for so long. And again, it's just a representation uh, in so many ways of the ongoing battle that we still have, you know, um, that maybe has just switched from, you know, the sacrificial temple system to another kind of ritual three times a day on our plate all the time. And now it's just, you know, the killing and everything. If anything, it's, it's even, more horrendous because it's it's locked away in in walls you know behind walls where we can't see it back then they were able to see a lot more of it but anyhow i digress all i was saying is that it's uh when you do when you do start to open your mind a bit and your heart a bit to this you'll see so many things in a different way and the nativity is a great example of that that's a, such a great reminder for me every year to to really uh feel into what the mission is all about yeah, thank you. And, you know, my friend, his name is Jeff Francis. He's in Portugal right now from England. And he's he's been an activist for 52 years. And his, I would like to just say his website is uh, Bonobo TV. And the Bonobos were a much more gentler calming, especially the, the females in them. When, when the males would get a little agitated, they would come behind them and start grooming them and settling them down. The females, the feminine energy in the Bonobo tribe of, of, of primates. And uh, so we will share his um, beautiful painting together because I, I, I know that, um, I know that there's people that have been activists forever and, and it's very difficult for whatever reason for them to, uh, get their work out to the world. So I would like to, um, help them do that because I know that you'll really resonate with this, with this painting as it, it's moved me to tears many times. So thank you again for your beautiful, uh, passionate heart and your documentary, yours and Kip's documentary, and continuing to bring it forth. I think this, the Christspiracy movement will be a movement like, uh, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's going that's to be. The, that's the goal. Yeah. That's the goal. Thank you so much, Cameron. Okay. Thank you.